Good morning. Good to see each of you here. I want to welcome those who may be visiting and also those who are uh, watching. You know, we have a lot of online members in different parts of the world. They have no local church they can attend, and so uh, we've adopted them. They are our online members, and there's quite a few that uh, participate in our worship service every week, and we greet them as well as those who may be watching on uh, Amazing Facts Television or one of the other networks. I was hearing about a wedding that was taking place in this cathedral and right at the moment where the priest was making his uh, wedding sermon and the bride and the groom were standing in front of him that someone's phone went off. And uh, you know, you've probably seen it before where someone's phone goes off during a solemn gathering and, and folks quickly, they, you know, we all do it, I've done it and we forget and we're stumbling around trying to uh, find it and turn it off real quick. Well, sometimes people, they can't find it or it's at the bottom of a purse and, and it just kept going and going and going. And uh, the priest got so irritated that he just paused in the middle of his wedding sermon and began to chastise everybody about not respecting sacred moments and they should know enough to turn off their phones during occasions like this in the house of the Lord and he resumed his sermon and the phone went off again and evidently it was the same phone because it had a unique ring and finally the bride leaned over and told the priest father it's your phone <laughs> true story <laughs> now weddings are interesting occasions and uh, they're great celebrations when you think about it, there's really no greater celebration in a society than a wedding. Um, you know, it's better than a birthday. You have lots of those. Hopefully you don't have quite as many weddings as birthdays. And it's supposed to be unique. And Jesus uses weddings several times to illustrate the gospel. A wedding is something that is supposed to be a lasting covenant. And our coming to Jesus is supposed to create this lasting covenant and this, this uh, union in love and this uh, security and joy. And they're supposed to be great occasions. The Bible tells a story of a very great, very expensive wedding. And some people missed out. They neglected the invitation. And uh, we're going to be talking about someone missing out on the most expensive wedding in history. But I'd like to begin with an amazing fact. The most expensive wedding, according to Guinness World Records, is it took place in 2004 in London. The wealthiest man is a steel magnate. His name is Lakshmi Mittal. He threw a wedding for his daughter, uh, Vanishia Mittal, who is 23, one of the most lavish wedding affairs the world has ever seen. She married a young London banker, Amit Bhatia, 25, in a traditional Indian ceremony that lasted five days. In Bible times, weddings would last seven days. Thousands of wedding invitations were sent out with 20 pages of poetry, site descriptions, festival details that were delivered to individuals in silver boxes. The wedding took place in the Palace of Versailles in France, one of the most beautiful palaces in the world. I, I've been there, I don't know if you've read about it. Along with a fireworks display and a concert at the Eiffel Tower. And then of course another ceremony at King Louis XIV's former chateau. 1,000 guests were flown on 12 private planes, private jets from India to Paris. The guests were booked in to accommodations at the Grand International Hotel in Paris. They reserved the whole hotel, which is the nicest hotel in the city, all 600 rooms, just the accommodations were $2 million. Amenities for those staying in the hotel included a 24-hour snack bar and the entire first floor was converted into a beauty salon with hairdressers and makeup artists and a team of 38 chefs preparing over 100 types of dishes. There were also luxury cars, complete with bars, provided for the disposal of all the guests to travel within Paris. And this went on five days. All the entertainment for the occasion 
was the big name pop stars and even some Bollywood stars. One who reportedly was paid $500,000, half a million dollars to perform for 30 minutes. It uh, hopefully made memories. The price tag, $78 million for a wedding. Now can you imagine being invited? And this, by the way, was a destination wedding. They were from London. They went to France. Can you imagine being invited to a destination wedding and they pay for your airfare and they pay for your wedding garments and pay for your clothes and everything and you go to the destination but you get so busy shopping in the curio shops on the beach that you forget to attend the ceremony. Or when they finally call you and say, it's time for the ceremony, you say, yeah, no, I don't think I'm going to be going. Well, Jesus shares a similar scenario in the Bible. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 22. We will be reading verses 1 to 14, and then I'll stop and we'll talk about it. This is going to be our study today. It's the parable of the great wedding feast. Matthew 22, verse 1. I should give you a little background as you're finding that. This parable is shared the Wednesday before Jesus goes to the cross. You'll notice that in the stories that Christ is sharing and in his teaching, he, he's appealing to the people and especially the Jewish nation to humble themselves and recognize him as the Messiah. But as they harden their hearts and they seal their plans to actually have him murdered, he becomes a little more direct in his teaching. And he preaches a series of several parables that warns them that they are at risk of making the biggest mistake in the world of rejecting the Messiah, the very one that they have been raised up to introduce to the world. And so we read here, I'll start with verse one. <clears throat> and Jesus answered and spoke again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Again, he sends out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and they went their own way, some to his own farm and others to his business. The rest, of his, his, uh, the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about this, he was furious and he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways and as many as you find invite to the wedding. So the servants went out into the highways and they gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now I think that um, those listening understood the significance of this parable. It's delivered in a special sense to the Jewish nation, but it's also very much given to us today. Uh, this wedding is not just for one race of people. The invitation goes to everybody. So have you been invited to an expensive wedding before? You know, there are important occasions and because it's recognizing a wonderful covenant. Karen and I went to a wedding. I heard later it cost $150,000. I don't doubt it. Four days after the wedding, the bride decided she just didn't want to be married and called it off. I wanted to know if we could get our gift back. <laughs> I mean, maybe you should go more than four days, right? It should still be under warranty after that time. In Bible times, weddings were very important occasions. Just so you understand, 
how things operated back then. They did not tell time with clocks. They did, they did not send out invitations that says, the wedding will be on November 3rd at one o'clock at this location. They would say it would be uh, during the time of the fall harvest moon uh, this year or something like that because getting all of the people and the things together for a wedding, it, it was a, a big affair and they would just get like an approximate time you remember the story of the ten virgins. And it says the bridegroom was tarried. Why the bridegroom was delayed. And so messengers would go out and say the time for the wedding has come. And everybody, it was assumed that if uh, they had agreed to come, they'd drop what they were doing and they'd go to the wedding. They're big occasions. And they would last for days. You read about the, when Jacob woke up and he found out that uh, his father had switched wives on him. Uh, the father said complete her seven days he had to complete the seven day feast for Leah and then they'd have another seven day feast for Rachel but they had two wedding feasts back to back and you can read the same thing in the story of Samson the seven days of the feast it talks about I remember a few years ago we were at a wedding oh, I should say we were at the wedding we were in India I was there with our team we were doing some programs and uh, our son Micah was there and Doug Hill who is six feet six and Micah is six two and we were walking down the streets and there's this big Indian wedding and they were two or three days into the wedding I think they must get tired they get the music and the drummers look exhausted and they go sometimes all night and the wedding guests are all exhausted they saw us walking down the street they tried to pull us into the wedding just because we would at least be a novelty <laughs> and we thought about it but some of that curry in South India could really hurt you. And so we said, no, oh, thanks very much. <laughs> but it was a big occasion and everybody came. And um, so th this is not just a wedding, this is the wedding of a king. This is the greatest wedding, the greatest social celebration being put on by the greatest personage. And it's the greatest invitation for the person of his greatest love, his beloved son and his beloved bride. And so everything in just that simple sentence tells us that this is the supreme invitation. There's nothing greater. And that's why when people are hearing the parable and they hear that they wouldn't come, there probably was a gasp in the crowd. That would be unthinkable. So just breaking it down little by little, there's a king. Who's the king? Well, the Bible explains it. It's, of course, God the Father. 1 Timothy 1.17, Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God alone is wise and honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So you've got the king, which would be God the Father, and then who is his son? Uh, we don't even need to, I think, prove that with a verse. And God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son, the beloved son. And so Jesus would be the son. And then it tells us about this wedding feast. What is that? And you want to know maybe who is the bride? Look in Revelation 19, 9. He said, write, blessed are those. I'm sorry, yeah, Revelation 19, 9. He said, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Now, when God tells John to write, would it be safe to assume then that God wants you and me to read what was written? The fact that he's wanting John to write it, I think would indicate he wants us to read what was written. There has been an invitation written for you and I to attend the greatest occasion in history, that of the marriage supper between the groom, Jesus, and the bride, his church. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as also Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. You can read also Revelation 21, verse 9. Then one of the seven angels talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And you read in Revelation 21, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so the bride in this parable is the church. So you are both, uh, you are the invited 
person and you're also the bride if you're part of the church. Now you'll notice how many invitations are given in this parable. Three. Let's count them together one by one. First invitation says he sends out his servants and this is in verse 3. It says he sends out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. Now when it says calling the ones who were invited it's understood from the language there that there are people who had already heard about the wedding, they had been invited, they agreed to come, finally the message comes and says come now everything's ready. And these are people who ostensibly knew about it, they professed they were interested in coming but they don't come. That first invitation is going to Israel, the Jewish nation. These are the people who said we're looking for the Messiah to come, uh, we are his children, you know, we want to sit down and feast with him in the kingdom. Even someone said to Jesus one day, blessed is he who can eat and drink in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus said, well, let me tell you a parable about this feast where you don't just bring your friends, you bring in the poor and the lame and the maimed and the blind. But they always talked about being at that feast in the kingdom and they used to make sport of the Gentiles who were on the outside. That's what the parable of the rich man and Lazarus is all about in Luke chapter 16. This rich man feasts while Lazarus lays at his gate and then we find out the one that lays at the gate is in Abraham's bosom and the one who's feasting ignoring his neighbor he's on the outside in the darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this first invitation is supposed to go to the Jewish nation. Come. But they're not willing to come. It says he sends out his servants. Who are the servants that were telling about the wedding? You look in Daniel 9. Daniel's praying. He says, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws which he has set before us by his servants, the prophets. Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants the prophets. God has sent out his servants to invite people to the wedding and especially for the Jewish nation they got the whole Old Testament the servants of God were inviting them to be in the kingdom feasting to come to this occasion and they said yes absolutely sign me up but finally when Jesus comes what's the reaction? The wise men come into Jerusalem and say where is he that is born king of the Jews? It's interesting the only people who were looking for the coming of the Messiah were some uneducated shepherds and some foreigners. God's own people. When the wise men showed up they said what? King of the Jews? What are you talking about? We got Herod. He's the king of the Jews. His own people were not ready. And look at this. This is the great invitation and by the way Romans 1.16 Paul says for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first who got the first invitation the Jews the people of Israel he called out Abraham in a special way and said through your seed all nations will be blessed I want your seed to introduce the Messiah and announce him to the world which actually did happen it was 12 Jews on the day of Pentecost that were his apostles but they were fishermen and shepherds it should have been the religious leaders that spotted it that had the scriptures. God's word was fulfilled Jesus was introduced and announced but those who said they were coming didn't come they were too busy with the things of the world and just look at this through the invitation here the king is saying come 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 and they're too busy the great invitation you know you got two great declarations in Matthew you've got Matthew chapter 28 where you have the great commission go into all the world teach the gospel to all creatures baptizing them in the name of the Father Son and Holy Spirit it says all authority all power is given unto me go but before that he says come Matthew 11 come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden I'll give you rest and in this wedding you can see the language where he's saying come come to me Proverbs 124 what's the problem? Because I've called and you refused. I've stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Just it's such a tragic picture that the almighty king how awesome that he would say I want to be with you in the kingdom. I want to feast with you. 
The Bible says he knocks on the door and if we open the door and let him in, he will abide with us. We'll sup together. What a privilege. And people say, no, we're too busy. So that's the first invitation. Well, the king, you'd think at that point, he would throw his hands in the air and say, all right, let's just wipe them all out. Unappreciative. And you got the second invitation. Again, he sent out other servants, sends them to the same group. But something's changed. He says, tell those who are invited, the ones who accepted the invitation, you got the invitation, you said you were coming. See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my cattle. Now, it's not just a sheep or a chicken that's been slaughtered to feed a family. This is oxen, one ox will feed in a small army. But he's got oxen, it's the plural, and cattle, and they're slaughtered, and they have no refrigerator back then. So you got the picture, when the time was right for the wedding, you needed to show up because things just didn't keep that long. You know what else he's saying here? He says, there has been a great sacrifice. These oxen and cattle being slaughtered is a symbol of a sacrifice that's taken place. So even after Jesus died, did God still open the door to the Jewish nation? He did. In Christ, in fact, Jesus said to the apostles, do not go yet in the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm going to invite them again. The Messiah came. He died for their sins. This is what Peter said at Pentecost. You hung him on a tree. They said, what shall we do? Repent. Accept the invitation. Some did, but the majority of the nation, what did the religious leaders do? When Stephen preached, what did they do? They killed him. And how did they treat the apostles? Read Matthew, I'm sorry, read Acts chapter 5. They put him in jail. And then you read Acts chapter 12. They killed James. You read Acts chapter 8. A great persecution arose in Jerusalem and the disciples were scattered everywhere. Look at the patience of God. God is long-suffering, but is there an end to his patience? He said, I've, I've made the sacrifice. Come, look at the tender patience. But they still don't come. Now, just so you know, not only is Jesus the bridegroom, Jesus is the lamb in this story. It says they made light of it. They made light of it and they went their way. Verse 5, one to his farm and another to his business. So you got two reactions here. One is just acting like, yeah, yeah, I, they don't care. Or they're joking or they're teasing or they're mocking. But the other group is made angry. And the, that kind of describes the two reactions you have in the world regarding Christianity and religion. In a one group, they're indifferent about Christianity and religion and Jesus. They're just interested in the things of the world. They go to their farm, they go to their business. But then you have some, they're hostile and they kill the messengers. They wouldn't accept it. They made light of it and they went their way. You know, Jesus tells a similar parable in Luke chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, don't lose your place in Matthew 22, but you might look there in Luke 14. He said to them, a certain man gave a great supper. Notice it's not just a supper, it's a great supper. And he invites many, many are called. Few are chosen. Many, the Bible says, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. Few there be that find it. Broad is the way to destruction and many, many ignore the invitation. A man gave a great supper. I'm in Luke 14, 16. And he sent out his servants at supper time saying to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord in great harmony, they make excuses. The first one said to him, I bought a piece of ground and I need to go see it. Oh, I would think you'd go look at it before you bought it. That was kind of lame. The other one says, um, I bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to test them again. I want to buy a pickup truck without testing it first. Please have me excused. Still another one says, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. I remember an old song. I've never heard any church sing it, but I only heard it once or twice, but it's stuck in my head. The chorus, 
I won't sing it, but I'll say it. I can't come to the wedding, don't bother me right now. I've married a wife, I've purchased a cow. I bought me some land that cost a pretty sum. Oh, please do excuse, I cannot come. And it's a song about this uh, parable where everyone says, so busy. And if people are preoccupied with places, possessions, and people. The Bible says our hearts are overcharged with the cares of this life so that we forget about the great feast that Jesus has prepared. They don't come. And they mistreat the messengers. It says they seized his servants and treated them spitefully and killed them. Apostles were whipped. John the Baptist was murdered. They were thrown in prison. Now how does a king respond after this second invitation is rejected? He said, all right, I've gone the second mile. I, I made a great sacrifice, invited them. Can you imagine the insult of um, treating a, a sovereign this way? It's, it's what you would call criminal indifference. It'd be one thing if he invited them and said, you know, I've got another occasion or I'm having a mother's funeral, I can't come. I mean, you'd have to have a really good excuse not to come to a king's marriage of his son. But then to treat the messengers that way, listen to what Jesus said. The king heard about it. Now you've got the wrath of the king. He was furious and he sent out his armies. This king has not just got a couple of soldiers, he's got armies. He destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Now those listening did not misunderstand what Jesus was talking about. Christ in this parable is pronouncing the doom that would come on those who rejected the second invitation. After three and a half years after the cross, the gospel was preached exclusively to the Jewish nation. But when Stephen was stoned, now the gospel went to the Gentiles. Paul was converted shortly after the stoning of Stephen. That was in Acts chapter 7 and 8. Acts chapter 10, Peter gets a vision. He goes to the Gentiles. Paul's converted. He and Barnabas tell the Gentiles, seeing that you reject the gospel, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. So now the, you've got this third invitation that takes place, but the king said that the city would be destroyed and burned. Did that happen? Isaiah 65, verse 12 Therefore, I will number you for the sword. By the way, what happened to Israel? It's talking about us. Uh, Israel is just the, the stubbornness and the pride of Israel. It's not unique to that race. It's describing the human race. It says in Isaiah 65, 12, Therefore, I will number you for the sword and you will all bow down to the slaughter because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear, but you did evil before my eyes. How is the Lord calling? Saying, come to me, come to me. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. Why will you die? He's calling us to come to him, to be saved from our sins, to be given a new heart. And if we're preoccupied with the sins of this life, there's a judgment that comes. You know, if you just go one chapter later, Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come on this generation. Matthew 24, then, he says, there will not be left one stone upon another in Jerusalem. At the end of chapter 22, he says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stone those who are sent to you. They knew what Christ was saying. If you look, go back to Matthew 22. You may already be there. Go to chapter 21, verse 45. It's the very end of chapter uh, 21. Now when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived he was speaking about them. Instead of repenting, they sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the multitude, for they took him for a prophet. He was not mincing words anymore. He was not pulling his punches anymore. Now Jesus is being very clear what their doom was going to be if they continued with their plot. And, um, of course, we know what happened. So, fortunately, the wedding is still going to go on. So you end up with the wrath of the king. The city's destroyed. Titus, the general, in 70 A.D., under um, 
Vespasian be Caesar. Jerusalem was destroyed. The city was burned. The temple was destroyed. The very thing that Jesus foretold happened. So is the wedding over now? No. The invitation still goes. What did he tell them? He said, go out into the highways. If you read in Luke, it says highways and hedges. Uh, Israel was a country that was on international trade roads between three continents. And you could go up to Europe, you could go into Asia, you could go into Arabia, you could go into Africa, all going through Israel. And what did the disciples do? They went everywhere preaching the gospel so that Paul said in his lifetime the gospel had been preached to every creature because he wants to save as many as he can. God is not willing that any should perish. Now you notice something in this wedding, there's never any mention of a shortage on the king's part. I remember before Karen and I got married, I was so excited. I was doing an evangelistic meeting. I told everybody the date of the wedding during a meeting like this. I said, you're all invited. I saw Karen cringe. <laughs> she said, how are we going to pay for all these people to come to a reception? I thought, well, who invited them to the reception? They can come to the ceremony and then they can go home. <laughs> they know we can't afford to feed them all. But the king never has any problem. Some people think, oh, how can I go to heaven, you know? There's not going to be enough room for me. All the billions of people that lived are, you know, if only a few are going to be saved, what are my chances? And Nowhere do you ever hear in any of Christ's parables anything that intimates that God is somehow going to run out of mercy or salvation or resources. That's never the issue. The problem in the parable is the response of the people. The harvest is great. The laborers are few. The people were just not interested. Their ears were dull. They were asleep in their sins. And they just didn't care about the wedding. But he sends out this third invitation. To who? You read in Revelation 14, every tongue and people. You can read in Isaiah 60, verse 3, that the Gentiles will come to the brightness, the light of your shining. Everybody's being invited. And so as this message is going out, people are responding. And it says they go out to good and bad. Now that doesn't mean that God is deliberately bringing bad people in. It basically is saying that people that would be judged by the world, good and bad, doesn't the Bible say, Christ said the, to the religious leaders, the publicans and the harlots and the sinners will enter the kingdom of God before you because they rejoiced at the preaching of John. They came, they repented. I mean, you think of the early church and it was composed of fishermen like Peter who said, Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, and he was, publicans like Matthew women of ill repute like Mary Magdalene but they recognized their need and they came to the Lord but the religious the people who thought they somehow had earned it because of their heritage you can never say Lord you know I'm a third or fourth generation Christian so you've got to save me you've probably heard before God has no grandchildren you're either a son or a daughter of God or you're not at all we almost have a personal relationship with the Lord. The, uh, the others weren't coming, but this third invitation, many came in, good and bad. Paul and Barnabas, I mentioned this before, but let me read it to you in Acts 13, 46. They grew bold and they said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, speaking to the Jews, but since you reject it, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. So the gospel then went to whosoever will, Jew and Gentile. Now, the people are coming into the wedding in droves. He says, my house is going to be filled. Someone's going to be in heaven. I want to be there, don't you? If you're not there, it's not going to be because there was not enough food or there was not enough wedding garments. There's enough for everybody. So the king comes in to see the guests. Now that word see there, it means to examine with inquisitive scrutiny. So you know what's happening here? Some who have said, yes, we're going to come to the wedding. There's a judgment before it's all over. And when the king comes in to see the guests, 
he notices that somebody is there in the common everyday drab rags of society and he has not taken advantage of the expensive royal wedding garment that the king has provided. And you know, you've probably seen the wedding pictures where you get all the attendants up front, you know, and the bride and the bride's mother, whoever and her girlfriends, they all pick out the color and they'll say, okay, we're gonna do lavender with, you know, a, a, a yellow rose or red rose or something. And that's the color men you're gonna wear ties that match the girls' dresses and they go to great lengths. So when they take the pictures, everyone's matching and it's all color coordinated. And you imagine some guy, he's supposed to be a groomsman, he walks into the wedding and he's got, you know, pink polka dots and yellow and purple striped pants and he says, hey, I'm here for the pictures. He said, no, you can't, can't get into the pictures like that. You're gonna wreck the whole thing. So it's not only that this guy comes and he's gonna wreck the photographs, he doesn't have the righteous robe. He's what you call a wedding crasher. The king says, how did you get in here, friend? You know, it's the same thing Jesus said to Judas in the garden. Friend, have you come to betray your master with a kiss? And this man pretended he was a friend of the king, but he didn't put on the wedding garment and his name was not in the book. You know, Jesus has got a book of life and we need to have our names entered in that book. That happens now. I remember hearing a story about um, this wedding in Utah where the photographer was, you know, looking for good shots to take. The ceremony was done and people are now greeting the, the groom and the bride and this one lady, 50, 60 years old, she she walks up to the young groom, walks right by the bride, walks up to the young groom, and you know, the photo photographer's wanting to catch candid moments, and she plants herself in front of him so he can't go to the right or left, and she gets a hold of his lapel, and she pulls him down, and he, she thinks he's gonna, he thinks she's gonna whisper something in his ear. She gives him a big kiss right on the lips. Way too long, it was very awkward. <laughs> and the photographer got it, and someone said, oh, that must be his aunt. But from the expression on the groom's face, no one was really sure. And then she went in because the dinner had started. She went up to the buffet table and got five crystal plates, filled them all, took them back, ate it all, got up and danced a little bit with everybody, went back to the table, got five more plates of food, and was on her way out when the caterer stopped her and said, you can't take the crystal plates out. And they said, we'll give you a, you know, styrofoam doggy bag or whatever. That. Later, everyone's asking about this strange aunt and the family of the bride and the family of the groom said, we've never seen her before. <laughs> she evidently was somebody who never had her own wedding so she wanted to make the most of someone else's. <laughs> she kissed the groom and ate the food and then made her way out. <laughs> wedding crashers. Karen and I have been at a lot of hotels where we're at different conventions. Sometimes the hotel shares with other events and we've seen weddings. I always say, hey, come on, Karen, we're all dressed up anyway. Let's go on in, you know. <laughs> we never have. <laughs> but I heard about this other wedding in uh, uh, the bride, uh, after the, um, the, the ceremony, they're having the reception and they've got this, you know, this slow dance taking place and she sees this couple in the middle of the dance floor, this older couple, and they're dancing together and she knows everybody on the list. She looks at them and she says, I don't know them. She walks up to them and says, well, I hope you're having a good time. And they said, actually, we don't know anybody here. They said, this is our wedding anniversary and we came to look at the hall where we got married. It was right here and you were having a wedding and my husband said, let's go dance. <laughs> she said, you are welcome to stay as long as you want. <laughs> I thought that was kind of sweet, you know. But some people crash the weddings, they just, uh, they want the, the gifts and the food and they want the prestige and, you know, you can't get into the kingdom unless you got the garment, friends. There's gonna be an investigation and it tells us that there was a judgment. The king said, what are you doing here? He had no answer. What is that wedding garment? This is the most important part of the message, friends. Ephesians 4.24, and that you put on the new man or new woman, 
which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. It's having a transformed character. It's having the righteousness of Christ. Revelation 19 verse 8. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. We don't have to guess, friends. You've been invited to the wedding, but if you are going to be chosen to stay at the wedding, you need to have that garment of righteousness on. We are saved by grace, but you know the Bible says we're all judged by our works because your works are going to show whether you have been saved by grace if you put on the righteousness of Christ. Isaiah 61 verse 10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my soul shall be joyful in my God for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation he's covered me with the robe of his righteousness we don't have to guess what that robe is do we? again look at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse her his bride with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish song of Solomon you are fair my love there is no spot in you there's a beautiful quote in the book Christ's object lessons page 310 by the wedding garment in the parable is represented the pure spotless character which Christ's true followers will possess Right now, the Lord is offering us that righteousness. You receive it by receiving Christ. You come to him. He covers your sin. And as you follow him, he sanctifies you. And it will be seen that uh, you are indeed his child. Then finally, there is a final judgment, a verdict, you might say. This man who has no answer for the king says, you can't stay. Take him away and cast him into outer darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't think I need to explain to you what that means, but it's, it's where the lost go. The devil and his angels are cast into the lake of fire. They're cast out like those five foolish virgins. They're left out in the darkness and the door was shut. And they don't go into the wedding feast. We've got to have the oil in our lamps, friend. Revelation 20, verse 9. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them what happened to that wicked kingdom in the city meaning Jerusalem is what happens later to the world that rejects the bridegroom we need to make sure our name is in that book of life amen now there's no shortage in the wedding there's plenty of room in the family of God amen and if there was a shortage did Jesus multiply wine at a wedding? First miracle of Christ. One of the first things that happens in the Bible is a wedding. Adam and Eve. You go to Revelation. Get the wedding supper of the Lamb. This is a beautiful story about an invitation. Some of the last words in the Bible. Revelation 22, 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, you have been invited by the groom and the bride let him who hears say come let him who is a thirst come whoever desires let him take the water of life freely what an incredible invitation everybody's being invited by this king there's no shortage of provisions it's like it says in Isaiah ho everyone that thirsts come ye to the waters you who have no money some people can't go to a destination wedding because they can't afford the airfare but you're without excuse. He's sending a jet of angels. Amen? You have no money. Doesn't matter. Come, buy and eat. Come, wine and milk without money, without price. Now, the title of this message is Missing the Most Expensive Wedding. You know why this is the most expensive wedding? Because the highest price ever paid for any wedding is for the wedding that you have been invited to. You've got a golden invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But if the truth be known, most people in the world, even in the church, are really too busy with the cares of this life to put on that robe of righteousness, to accept the sacrifice that has been made, and to come to that wedding. 
And I pray that today, if you realize that you have been preoccupied and distracted and not seeking first God's kingdom, not preparing for that great day when his chariots will come to take us to the feast, that you might make that decision now. Father, let it be that all here who receive that golden invitation of grace to come to the wedding supper of the Lamb, that we will receive it, believe, and respond in the affirmative. Lord, I pray that right now that all of us, we've been distracted sometimes with the cares of life, just the busyness of even good things, so we forget the most important thing, to make the king and his son and that feast the priority. I pray that you'll bless us, Lord, and forgive our sins. May we take up that robe of righteousness that Jesus offers, repent of our sins, be both justified and sanctified and ready for your return that we might be glorified in your presence that day. Please bless, we're living in a time of judgment even now. And I pray that you'll be with each person here. Give us the Holy Spirit and help us be your witnesses. We thank you and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for watching, friends. Does the Bible tell us what's coming next? Join us for Panorama of Prophecy, an amazing Bible adventure for an epic time in history. Watch 6.30 a.m. on Sunday, Channel 9 Gem, or watch via YouTube at Amazing Facts Oceana.